كذابا جزاء من ربك عطاء حسابا رب السماوات والأرض رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما الرحمن لا يملكون منه خطابا يوم يقوم الروح لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن وقال صوابا ذلك ذلك اليوم الحق ذلك اليوم الحق فما شاء يوم ينظر المرء ما قدمت يدا ويقول الكافر يا ليتني كنت ترابا صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من ألق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالكلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم رب شوالي صدري ويسلي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه كولي My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's a pleasure for me to be once again back to London, especially Harrow, after a span of eight months. The topic of this evening's talk is seeking knowledge in the light of Islam. Your children are an amana. Give them the best education for both the worlds. It is a long topic, but it's basically dealing with seeking knowledge in the light of Islam. And that your children are an amana, so give them the best education for both the worlds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the glorious Quran, the first guidance that he gave to the whole of humankind, it was not to pray, it was not to fast, it was not to perform hajj. But the first guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran to the whole of humankind was ikhra. It was to read, it was to recite, it was to proclaim. And I start my talk by quoting a few verses from the Quran, from Surah Ikhra, chapter number 96, verse number 1 to 5, where Allah says, Ikhra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, ikhra wa rabbuka al-akram, allazi alama bil kalam, which means read, recite, and proclaim in the name of thy Lord who has created. 
who has created the human beings from something which clings, a leech-like substance. Read, the Lord is most bountiful. He who has taught the use of pen has taught men that which he knew not. Though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the first guidance in the glorious Quran that we should read, but unfortunately, we realize that the Muslims, in the Muslim community, everyone does not read. And those Muslims who are involved in acquiring knowledge, in reading, they don't read as per the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah does not say only read. Allah says, Iqra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Read in the name of thy Lord. So when we read, when we acquire knowledge, we should acquire knowledge in such a way that we come closer to our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the knowledge does not bring you closer towards your creator, towards your Rabb, then that knowledge is not useful for the Akhirah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, it's a Sahih Hadith, which is mentioned in Ibn Majah, Hadith number 224, our beloved Prophet said, Talibul ilmi, seeking knowledge, Faridatun ala kulli Muslim, is obligatory on every Muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman. It's compulsory that every Muslim should acquire knowledge. And it is the duty of us Muslims to see to it that we acquire knowledge. Many of us, we think that knowledge is only what we study in schools, in colleges, and universities. Education and knowledge starts at home. And the best teacher is the mother. It is the duty of the parents to see to it that they properly educate the children. See to it that they give them proper education. Because the child, when he or she is born, they are not responsible for the environment in which they are born. It is the duty of the parents to see to it that irrespective of the environment, they give them proper education. And today we find that there are various societies and the various ways of life in these societies. We have the Islamic way of life, we have the Western way of life, and we have a variety of different ways of life. As far as Islam is concerned, Islam is a complete way of life. It caters both to the spiritual aspect of the soul as well as the physical aspect of the body. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number three, on this day have I completed your religion for you and have completed my favor for you and have chosen for you Islam. So once Islam is completed, nothing new can be added or subtracted from it. Our deen is complete. So as far as the way of life is concerned, Islam is a complete way of life. When we mix Islam with the other societies and other ways of life and other cultures, whichever culture we're living in, if that part of the culture is not against the Islamic Sharia, is not against the Quran and the Sai Hadith, we do not mind following or agreeing with that culture. But if that culture, if that society goes against Quran and Sai Hadith, we should not follow it. Islam is number one. And now we find that many a time while upbringing our children, we have a problem because of the differences in societies and cultures. And we are aware of the Western society, as many of the Muslims, they are living in Western society. And we find that though the Western society, it is advanced in science and technology, but as far as moral values are concerned, they are declining. We find in the Western society that alcoholism is on the increase, drug addiction is on the increase, obscenity is on the increase, Adultery is on the increase, rape is on the increase, crime is on the increase. While educating our children, we should see to it that we give them 
a proper Islamic education. And while we train them and upbring them in a Western society or any society in the world, it may be an Eastern society also, we should see to it that we should make them a good Muslim. That is, one who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And any person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. While educating our children, we should see to it that we should not get so much impressed by the Western society. We should only take the correct values from the society. We don't want our children to become alcoholics, to become drug addicts, to become adulterers, to become rapists. We want them to be good Muslims who submit the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said that every child, he is born in Deenul Fitr. Deenul Fitr means the innate religion. Every child is born as a Muslim. He submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, the elders, the parents, the teachers, they influence the child. He may remain on the straight path or he may become a fire worshipper, he may become an idol worshipper, and then he may go outside the fold of Islam. But every child initially, irrespective whether he's born in a Hindu family, whether he's born in a Christian family, a Jewish family, or a Muslim family, he is born as a Muslim. He submits civil to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, by the influence of other people, parents, teachers, elders, he may go on the wrong track. That's the reason. Whenever any non-Muslim, he accepts Islam, the more appropriate and correct word is revert. He was on the straight path, he went on the wrong track, and then he came back on the straight path, on the straight track. So the correct word is revert. And we have got proof and evidence that every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. There were researches done on two tribes, the Kapauku tribe and the Australian Aborigin tribe. These two tribes did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. And later on, when researchers went and tried to find out what was the way of life, it was everything of Islam but in name. They did not call themselves Muslims, but they believed in one God. They believed that God did not have any idols or images. They believed he was not begotten. When they worshipped the God, they did the sujood. They prostrated. They were following the basics of Islam, but they didn't call themselves Muslims. So if we let a child after he's born, if we do not influence him with any of the teachings, that child will grow up to be a Muslim. That is the dinul fitr, innate religion. It is the duty of the parents that once the child is born, they should see to it that they give that child a proper environment to live and to continue life. It is the duty of the parents that they should see to it that they give proper education to the children. And many of us, we are worried about the education of our children. I would like to ask a question that when is the time you should start thinking about educating your child? What is the right time? Can anyone give the answer? That which is the right time? When do you start thinking what you want to make your child or what you want to make him? What should he be in life? Which is the right time? Which is the right time? Right from the beginning. As soon as he understands. Sorry? When he starts to think to get a child. He may start thinking after 10 years. Which is the right time? Seven years old. Seven years old, two years old, when he can understand, when he's born. One year old. One year old. Fine, here we have different options. Here someone is saying three years old. Three years old. Someone is saying three years old. Someone is saying two years old. Someone is saying one year old. Someone is saying when he's born. 
Islamically, the time to think of educating your child, the latest you should think, latest, huh? maximum, is when you choose your life partner. When you choose your life partner is the time you have to think about educating your child because the parents are the best teachers, especially the mother. That's the time if you want to make your child Islamic, you should see to it that you have a spouse who is Islamic. If you don't have Islamic spouse, how would you expect your child to be Islamic? So depending upon how you want to upbring your child is the time you start thinking when you choose a life partner. That does not mean already those who are married should choose a new life partner. <laughs> Some people ask me, now I'm already married, what should I do? <laughs> it is better late than never. You can start molding your life partner into that style. No problem, you can do dawa with the life partner. So you should realize that the best time to start thinking about educating your child, the latest is when you choose a life partner. As I was saying, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, it's a Sahih Hadith, which is mentioned in Ibn Majah, Hadith number 224, our beloved Prophet said, Talibul ilmi, seeking knowledge, Faridatun ala kulli Muslim, is obligatory on every Muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman. Now when we give knowledge to our children, we have to see to it that we give them proper knowledge. Knowledge can be broadly divided into two types. One is the basic knowledge of Islam. And second, knowledge what is required by the community. It's the duty of every parent that he should educate the children with the proper Islamic knowledge. Number one, most important is Tawheed, that believing in one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should not associate partners with anyone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be associated with anyone else. Tawheed, number one. Then all the pillars which most of us know, but we should impart it in the right way to our children. About salah, about zakat, about hajj, about fasting. It's very important. And, but natural, knowledge of the Quran. This Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yesterday in Bradford, I had a talk on Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding? And I told there that the best gift that a parent can give to the child is the Quran, and make the child understand the Quran. Most of us Muslims, we teach our children to read Arabic, they can read Arabic, but they can't understand. If we teach them the language of the Quran, the Arabic as a language, that is the best gift you can give. And inshallah, towards the end of my talk, I will deal and discuss with that in detail. The second type of knowledge is the knowledge required by the community. Knowledge which makes a person a doctor, makes a person an engineer, a lawyer, a scientist, an agriculturist. This is too required for the betterment of the community for the betterment of the society. But when we are acquiring the second type of knowledge, we should see to it that when we acquire scientific knowledge, when we learn about mathematics, geography, history, this knowledge should get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should not take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If this knowledge takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that knowledge is not correct knowledge. It's not correct education. It should bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, when we learn medicine, we learn how to save the lives of thousands of human beings. But in that same medical knowledge, when we learn how to do abortion, there are youngsters who are doing zina, and then they want to abort. So using this knowledge for activities which are wrong, we should abstain from that. Abortion for saving the life of the mother. If she has a health problem, Islam gives permission. Otherwise, Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31, and Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 151, that kill not your children for want of sustenance. Killing of children is prohibited. So whatever knowledge you acquire, it should be for the betterment of humanity and get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
whatever moral values you are learning, we should see to it that when we put our children in the school, that school should upbring our children properly. Imagine if we put our children in the convent school, many of whose values don't match with the value of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is like we are tying the hands and legs of our children and putting them in water and asking them to swim. How will they swim? So when we put them in a school, see to it you put them in a proper school. If the culture and society and the school teaches you manners, it should be good Islamic manners. Nowadays we find that in the Western culture, they say that manners is building old age homes. Islam has got no place for old age homes. Because Islam believes that we should love and respect our parents. And there are several verses in the Quran. Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 15, Surah Kabut chapter number 29 verse number 8, Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 151. Several verses we say that we have enjoined on the human beings that to be kind and good to your parents. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, verse number eight, in the book of Adab, chapter number two, hadith number two, there's a person who approached the Prophet and he asked him that who deserves the maximum love and companionship in the world? So the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that who? The Prophet again repeated your mother. The man asked after that who? Again, the Prophet said for the third time, your mother. The man asked after that too. Then the Prophet said, your father. 75%, three-fourths of the love and companionship goes to the mother. 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, mother gets the gold medal. She gets the silver medal as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. <laughs> so Islam teaches that we have to love our parents and especially as far as companionship is concerned, the mother gets three times more. So in Islam, there is no place for old age homes. So whatever manners and etiquettes that we teach our children, it should be in line with what our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And we find today that Muslims are in the firing line. We find that Muslims have become backward as far as science technology is concerned, as far as education is concerned. And the main reason is because we have gone away from the Quran and Sunnah. Previously, from the 8th to the 12th century, it was called as the Dark Ages. Dark for whom? Dark for the Europeans. The amount of advances the Muslim Arabs made, it is phenomenal. And if we read history, what we read in school, I myself have passed from a convent school, a Christian missionary school. I've got my education from there. It's later on, afterwards, I realized that what I read in school and in my medical college, I being a medical doctor, many things is something different. We are taught in school that the blood circulation was first discovered by William Harvey. In fact, if you read the Quran, Quran speaks about the blood circulation in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66. How does the food enter into the stomach? Then from there, it goes into the intestine. From the intestine, why the blood stream to various organs of the body, including the mammary glands, which are responsible for the production of milk. It speaks about the production of milk and about the blood circulation in a nutshell in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 66. After I did research, I came to know that the first human being who first described the blood circulation was Ibn Nafis, 600 years after the Quran was revealed and 400 years before William Harvey. But when we read in our textbook, we are told about William Harvey. How many of us know about Ibn Nafis? How many of us? Hardly anyone knows that Ibn Nafis was the first person who described the blood circulation. We learn about geography, but the person who drew the first world map of geography was Ali Drusi in 1154. What we study, the digits in school, you know what it's called? It is called as Arabic numerals. The one, two, three, four that we use for writing. One, two, three, four. It is called as Arabic numerals. The other is a Roman numeral. The Indians were the people 
who first discovered about the zero, and the Arabs took it from there and made it famous to the world by adding a decimal. That's how we have the system today. We learn in mathematics about the Pythagoras theorem that the square of the hypotenuse in a triangle is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. The Pythagoras theorem that we learn in school, it was first discovered by Al-Tusi. So we know that Muslims, few centuries back, they were advanced in science and technology. But when we read in our textbook today, they are hardly mentioned. Who is the father of trigonometry? It is Al-Biruni. Have you heard of Al-Khindi? Al-Khindi wrote 200 works in mathematics, in geometry, in logic. And at a time when Galileo, Descartes, and Newton, when they said that all physical laws are absolute, he said that it was relative. Later on, Albert Einstein did more research, and he propounded the theory of relativity. When we read history, we come to know that Muhammad, Ahmed, and Hassan Shakir, these brothers, they measured the surface area of the Earth by measuring the angle at the Red Sea at a time when people thought the world was flat. We learn chemistry, and we are told that Geber is the person who discovered alcohol. It is Jabir ibn Hayyan, Jabir. When they write in our textbook, it's Geber, Geber, sounds like a Westerner, Geber. It is Jabir ibn Hayyan. So when we read, we think oh, it's a Westerner, Geber, Geber. And Jabir ibn Hayyan, he discovered alcohol, and the word alcohol comes from the Arabic word al-gul, meaning evil spirit. When we read history, we come to know about Muhammad Zakaria Arrazi. He was advanced in the field of medicine, and he even wrote books on measles and smallpox. When we read medicine, we know that Ali ibn Abbas, he wrote 20 volumes on practice and theory of medicine. We are told about Avicenna, Avicenna, the Aristotle of the East. It is Ali ibn Sina. Ali ibn Sina, he was called as the Aristotle of the East. He was a philosopher, he was a mathematician. So when we go back to history and we see that we Muslims, we were on top of the world. The reason we were on top of the world at that time is because at that time, we were close to the Quran and Sunnah. Now, we have gone away from Quran and Sunnah, and that's the reason we are in the firing line. We should see to it that we bring our children close to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. It is a duty that we give our children proper education. That is the reason, I say, that your children are your amana. See to it you give them proper education for both the worlds. And this was a dilemma that I faced maybe eight years back. And though, alhamdulillah, I used to give talks on education. And I did take time to choose my life partner because I wanted the right life partner. And finally, Allah gave me, alhamdulillah. And when the children were born, my eldest son is 12 years old. And I always had that thing that we should have a proper school which has a striking balance between the Islamic education and the formal education. I don't call mathematics science as secular education because secular by definition means nothing to do with God. I believe science believes in God. Mathematics is Islamic subject. So therefore, when I talk about the other conventional subjects, I call them formal education. Mathematics, science, history, geography, English. We call it as formal subjects. So I always had that dream that to have a school which has the striking balance between the Islamic subjects, Islamic education, and the formal education. Because mathematics, science, history, according to me, are part of Islam. And that made me tour the world. And I did a survey, alhamdulillah, of most of the Islamic schools at that time. That was about six to eight years back. In a span of two, three years, mashallah, I went to most of the best schools of the world, in America, in Canada, in UK, in South Africa, in Australia, in Malaysia, 
and I visited hundreds of schools. And when I observed that in the Western countries, most of the Islamic schools, almost all, they were more of a Muslim managed school. Muslim managed school means the management was Muslim, but I would not call them as Islamic schools. Because we realize that in the Western world, there is a fear of alcoholism, of drug addiction, of obscenity. So in these schools, we found that the dress code that the students wore, they were Islamic hijab, mashallah. They had a time for prayer, for salah, alhamdulillah. There was no alcohol, there was no drug, alhamdulillah. So that was what was called the Islamic school. Where back in India, most of the Muslim many schools, they have the Islamic dress code, you can offer salah, there's no alcohol, there's no drug. So I did not find something new. But alhamdulillah, considering the Western country, where drug addiction is common, alcoholism is common, obscenity is common, it is an achievement which I was happy. But what I came to search for, that when our children go to school, they should get the best of knowledge, I could not find any of the schools. What we wanted that we have now the Muslim Ummah, rather divided into two types of education. One type of education, when we have secular education, they acquire the so-called secular education, which are called a formal education. They acquire knowledge of mathematics, science, history, geography, but they are far away from the deen. On the other hand, when we go to our madrasas, we teach about Quran, Hadith, Sharia, Fiqh. Alhamdulillah, may Allah give them reward. But they are unaware of mathematics, science, history, geography. So we wanted a balance between the two, to have the best of both, which when we visited most of the schools that I visited, now the thing is changing. In the past six years, I've realized that some schools have become slightly closer, alhamdulillah, to the concept that I have. But most of the schools, they may be having maybe three periods a week on Islam, or maybe one period a day. Maximum I came across was two periods a day on Islam. And what was the main objective that a child, when he passes from school, he should have the knowledge of Quran, Hadith, Sharia, Fiqh, and science, etc. That I could not find. Though I visited the best of schools in America, in South Africa, which is supposed to be very much advanced in this field of Islamic schools, UK, Australia, Malaysia, etc. So that we thought that, let's make an effort. And with Allah's help, Alhamdulillah, we in Bombay, Alhamdulillah, about approximately six years back, or rather five and a half years back, we launched our own Islamic school by the name of Islamic International School. Because for my children, we had to do it. Though I was prepared to see to it that gear up my child, though putting in a convent school by giving all the so-called education at home, but then we thought that we should make a sample school. And alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, we ventured with this project in Bombay, and Allah helped us, and with Allah's support, we launched the school. And alhamdulillah, from day one, the response that we received from the people of Bombay, from the Muslims of Bombay, was tremendous, mashallah. The response was such that though the school was absolutely new, we hardly publicized it. We decided to start the school. There was only three weeks publicity, mashallah. But immediately when the school was launched, the amount of response we got was phenomenal. And it was overwhelming that ministers, they phoned our school to see to it that some of the friends get admission to the school. It was good, mashallah. You will hardly find a minister phoning a madrasa and telling that, you know, I want a seat in your madrasa. We find that in the convent school. In India, most of the convent school, the ministers phone, and they try and use the influence. But alhamdulillah, we are very strict as far as admission criteria is concerned. We are very strict with the guidelines. And unless a person fulfills our guidelines, let him be a minister, son also, we won't give admission, alhamdulillah. The difference that is there, that we appreciated that the movement that was started by many of the philanthropists and educationists throughout the world, it was a good movement, at least giving them an environment of Islam. So I was really happy that in the Western countries, whether it be USA, UK, there were schools in which a child could at least practice his Islam. When the school that we launched, we had a different system we had, that I wanted a striking balance that when a child passes the 10th standard, 
he should become at least an average alim when he passes from Darul Ulum, as well as be able to compete with the best of convent schools in that city. That was the aim. And with that target, we started the school. And we did many unconventional things, which people told it's not possible. But Alhamdulillah, with Allah's help, we did it. The timing of a school is quite long. It starts from 8 o'clock to 4.30. For nursery, it is less. We started school from nursery, from the age of three. And the first year, we had nursery, junior kg, senior kg, and first standard, only four classes, only four grades. And the timing from first onwards, first upwards, is from 8 o'clock to 4.30. And people said the timing is too long. Students won't be able to take it. But alhamdulillah, we divide the day into 12 periods, each of 35 minutes. On an average, two periods every day are for extracurricular activities. Martial arts, whether it be taekwondo, judo, swimming, whether it be computers, and all the extracurricular activities, on an average, two periods a day. Every child, it's compulsory, should learn swimming, taekwondo, judo, martial arts, for the boys, football, etc. And the balanced 10 periods, five periods are in English and five in Arabic. Our school has a dual minimum instruction, English and Arabic. Arabic is the language of the Quran. It's the language in which the last and final revelation was revealed. We realize, I realize the drawback, that because our parents did not think it important that we should learn Arabic as a language, we know it's a drawback, even today. So we want to see to it that our children, our next generation, they should know Arabic as the mother tongue. So five periods are in Arabic, five are in English. But naturally, the five periods that are then Arabic, they're Islamic, whether it be Arabic language, whether it be Hivs, whether it be Talawat, whether it be Hadith, whether it be Quran, Tafsir, and all the Islamic studies that we have, when we give the Tafsir of the Quran, it's not in English or Urdu. Like back home in India, Pakistan, we have the Islamic studies in Urdu. In the Western countries, we either have in Urdu or we have in English. There, we have in Arabic, Arabic to Arabic. So the child, from the age of three, when he joins nursery school, he starts learning Arabic. When we teach him A for Allah, B for Bismillah, along with that, min alif asadun, min ba baitun, min ta tufahun. So from the age of three, the child is ingrained with the Arabic language. And in the Arabic period, the children cannot speak English, they should only speak Arabic. In the English period, only English, no Arabic. And most of Arabic teachers, they have gone to Saudi Arabia, and they've graduated from the Islamic University of Medina, so that even the pronunciation is correct. Besides the Arabic period that is there, the five periods in English, one period every day is Islamic studies in English. That's for Dawa. Because the child, when he does Dawa with the non-Muslim, it will be in English, he can't do in Arabic. There are very few Arab non-Muslims. So one period is Islamic studies in English. The balance four periods on average is maths, English, geography, history, science, etc. And though the period, if you analyze that five periods in English, is very less. But we have been able to achieve this because the ratio of our teacher to student is very low. In Bombay, on an average, on an average, in Bombay, one school, each class has 50 students. Some have got 60, some have got 70, some have got 80. The good schools have got 50, very few schools have less than 50. And for every two classes, there are average three teachers. That means each teacher, the ratio of teacher and student is about 30 to 35. Every 30 to 35 students have got one teacher in Bombay and in India. If you go in the villages, it is much higher. Every one teacher has got 50 students on average. And the international standard says that it should be one is to 20. The good private schools in UK, USA, they have every teacher has got 10 students on average. The good private schools. We in Bombay, we have every five students, one teacher. Each class has got 20 students. On average, some have got 18, some have got 19. But at times, for example, when there are classes of HIVs, 
So in that class of 20 students, there will be five kurras coming in, karis. So each batch will have about four students. So when we have certain classes, it breaks up, so that the hips is better. The concentration is better, so the child can learn faster. In our school, HIVS is compulsory till standard three. Till standard three, the child in nursery junior KG, he starts the Asana Quran. He does the Nazar of the Quran in senior KG, starts doing HIVS in senior KG. On average, senior KG, he memorizes half Jews. First, second, and third, every year, one and a half Jews. So by the time the child completes standard three, he memorizes at least five Jews. Some may memorize six, some seven, some may even do four. After that, Hibs is optional. Those people who feel have got a good memory, we select them, maybe 25%, one fourth to one third of the students, and we call them one hour, 15 minutes earlier. So instead of coming at eight o'clock in the morning, from four standard, they come at cow to seven. Now, when the Hibs class in the morning is conducted, after third standard, for one kari, there are two students maximum. So the ratio of the kari and the students in the higher classes is reduced. One kari, one student, or one kari, two students maximum. And only because he comes one or 15 minutes early in the morning, does his for one or 10 minutes, in a year, on an average, that child memorizes five Jews. So by the time he completes the next five years, at the end of eighth standard, he memorizes the complete Quran. So, so far, mashallah, we are in the sixth standard. In the fifth standard, according to our normal course, the child should memorize 15 Jews. But many students, mashallah, at the end of fifth standard, have memorized 18 Jews, some 19, some even 20. So my son, who's now in the sixth, he's hardly 12 years old, mashallah, he knows more Quran than me. He knows 20 Jews, I don't know that much. I'm not Hafizul Quran. His Qur'an is better than mine. He can understand Arabic better than me. He can understand the Quran directly, I can't. So we want every child in our school to be better than what I was when I was in school. And inshallah, minimum, minimum, every child in our school, minimum, is 100 times better than what I was when I was a child. We want every child in the school should be multiple times like me. I am not the target. I am not the aim. I am not the sample. We want them to be multiple times better. So what we could not get in our childhood. And with Allah's help, Alhamdulillah, whatever we achieved, we feel that if we educate our children in the right way, right from the childhood, inshallah, inshallah, you will find a change in the next generation. <laughs> we always had a target that if we have to change the society, we do projects in the short term. We have short-term dawa courses in our foundation, Islam Research Foundation, which is a crash course for 40 days, where we train students from different parts of the world. We have international dawa training program for 40 days, where we select the best people, one from UK, one from USA, from Singapore, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, etc., and we give them a comprehensive training course. But this schooling of 13 years is a full-fledged dawa training program, according to me. And in our school, mashallah, we see to it that when they are trained, not only do they learn about Quran and Islam, they have been told about Christianity, about Judaism, about Hinduism, about Buddhism. Inshallah, when a child passes school, he will be far superior than an average Christian what he has knowledge about Christianity, what the average Hindu has knowledge about Hinduism, what the average Jew has knowledge about Judaism. The main aim of the school is to make dais and see to it that they follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in our school, mashallah, though main two languages are English and Arabic, we also start Urdu from the fourth standard. Third standard is Hindi, fourth is Urdu, and fifth is the local language of the state, that is Marathi. These children, mashallah, they're trained in a way that they know the values of life. And we find that many a time, mashallah, these children, they put us to shame. They put us to shame. And many times when we go out, and the children, mashallah, they're masoom. And that reminds me that once I'd gone to meet a very big businessman, a top businessman in Bombay, very big businessman. And when I met him, I had my son with me. 
That time he was in the second standard, and the businessman was smoking. So my son said, Uncle, smoking is haram. Finish. I would think 10 times. You know, though I'm a guy, you know, to say directly, we have to you know, see for the situation, and we see whether what is the right time, they should not feel hurt, etc. We'll think 10 times how to say, when to say, what to say. And the young child said, and the person put off his cigarette immediately. Easy. So, mashallah, we should see to it that we should have a vision of how do we want our children and what they should become. We have a concept that on average, when we have four divisions, if 100 students pass out in a year from one school, 50% may go in the mainstream, may become doctors, engineers, lawyers. But when they become doctors, they'll be true Muslim doctors, having knowledge of Islam, true Muslim engineers, true Muslim businessmen. 50% may go in the Islamic field, may become Dai, Muhaddis, Mufassir, may take up teaching, Islamic teaching, Alhamdulillah. So in this way, can we change the next generation? We can't keep on cribbing about what's happening. We should make a beginning. And in this way, mashallah, the main success that I feel of the school is that our interviews are very strict. The interviews we conduct are so strict that the rules that we started, the rules are unheard of. We broke most of the conventional pattern. Normally, for the students, they have got three interviews, the child. And even the parents are interviewed, the father and the mother. They have to undergo two interviews of average of one and a half hour each. And the final interview is taken by me. And alhamdulillah, in the second year, we had 800 applications. 75 seats, 800 applications. So most of the years, we have 10 times more number of applications than the number of seats. And let me tell you, our school is one of the most expensive schools in Bombay. The fees is, we had to 25,000 rupees a month, which is very expensive. Average fees in Bombay is 100, 150 rupees. The good convent schools, they charge 1,000 rupees, 1,500 rupees. Ours is 25,000 rupees. That is 600 in US dollars. Though now there are other schools which are much expensive. But Islamic school, mashallah, so not that it is cheap. But yet, no poor person can say that I did not get admission because I did not have money. We have 25% scholarship quota. The 25% of the seats, even if the person does not pay a single rupee a month, he can get admission. But 25% of the seats have been reserved for poor children. So in our school, we have, mashallah, parents who are earning more than a crore rupee a month. They may be millionaires there. They may be earning a million pounds they earn. There are some students whose parents earn 3,000 rupees. But when we give scholarship, we transfer that amount of fees into the current account. When they get the money, they come and pay full fees to the cashier. So even the cashier does not know who's a scholarship child. It's only the management, me, my wife who's the principal, and a few others who know who are scholarship children. So even the teachers don't know who's a scholarship child. So we maintain that secrecy. So we transfer the money in the account, they come and pay full fees. So even the cashier does not know. So that we have a proper system and equality while teaching. When we have the formal education, mathematics, history, science, geography, we see to it that in this, when we teach, we incorporate 25% Islam in it. For example, when we teach science, we talk about the Big Bang Theory, that a few decades earlier, the scientists have discovered how did our universe come into existence. First, there was a primary nebula, then there was a secondary separation, which gave us to galaxies, the stars, the planets, and the earth on which we live. Then we say, this is mentioned in the Quran 1,400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yalal lazina kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan azrat kan fsakna huma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together, and we clothed them asunder. Now this, what the scientists have discovered recently, the Quran mentions 1,400 years ago about the Big Bang. So in this way, the child comes closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the same time, he's being educated about science. We tell them that the first person who described the blood circulation, it was Ibn Nafis. Later on, William Harvey made it famous to the Western world. We even teach them Darwin's theory. Unlike the other schools, I realize that in some Western countries, a child goes to the normal convent school, government school. In the evening, he goes to evening madrasas. So in the morning, he's taught that the human beings have been created from monkey, and the evening is told 
that the first man is Adam alayhi salam. In the morning he's taught that riba is very good, interest, you can become a great businessman, wealthy person. In the evening he's taught riba, interest is haram. So there's dichotomy. There'll be confusion in the mind of the children. That does not mean don't send your children to madrasa. Madrasa are doing good work, alhamdulillah. They should continue. Better send them than don't send. Don't get me wrong. The madrasa are very good, mashallah. I'm for it. I'm not against it. But we have to keep on improving the standards. So whatever doing, mashallah, they're doing a good work. When I go to madrasa, I tell them that you incorporate English there. You incorporate the formal subjects. So when there is a different teaching in the morning and the evening, the child is confused. So when we teach science, we see to it that we incorporate and tell them even Quranic verses related to that. Quran speaks about water cycle, about geography, salt and sweet water. Quran speaks about geology, that mountains have got roots, and many things which is not mentioned in the textbook. The teachers, they are trained. They are trained how to teach. And in this way, out of the normal formal education, 25% Islam is even incorporated when we teach the mathematics, science, history, geography, etc. We have taken the normal syllabus, IGCSE. Following that syllabus, and even incorporating the Islamic studies, both in Arabic and English. So that when the child appears, he appears for the normal examination. That is the central board examination. After he passes that, he can take up medicine, take up engineering, or become a lawyer, or a businessman, or come to the mainstream of Islamic studies, no problem. He has his choice. And what we are doing, that we are in contact, mashallah, with those people who are experts in the world. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, First alu ahal zikri in kuntum la talamun. That, if you don't know, ask the person knowledgeable. So we are in touch with the knowledgeable people from different parts of the world. We are in touch with the local experts of Madinah University, of Umul Qura, etc. We are in touch. So that whatever thing that we want to put it into practice in our school, we consult with the experts, but we are doing many things which are unconventional. Many people told me, Rabbi Zakir, it's not possible. You can't have two streams at the same time. It's not possible. I tell them, at least make dua. At least make dua, inshallah. So what we want to do, we want to give a sample role model to the Ummah that it's possible. Though many people, majority said it's not possible, but Alhamdulillah, summa, Alhamdulillah, if you meet the parents, and if you see the annual day CD of a program, then you'll come to know, Alhamdulillah, that what is the level of education, mashallah. So as I was telling, the main thing is the interview. When we interview the parents, we are very strict. We are very careful that we see to it that the parents have the same thinking as the management. And we are very strict. In the first year, when we started the school, we had a clause, compulsory that the mothers should do hijab. More than 50% of the mothers in the first year of our school, they were not doing hijab. But within one month's time, mashallah, all of them had to do hijab. Now, when they want to admit their child, they do field work. Okay, if you want to get admission to Islamic International School, we have to do hijab. So before coming to the interview, they wear hijab. They're trained. Because they want admission in our school. So they do a survey. What is the requirement of the school? We have got, mashallah, millionaire parents who are businessmen, who are business tycoons. When they come for the interview, we ask them, how many times do you offer salah? So they tell us, Jummah ke Jummah. So we tell them, brother, then don't admit your child in this school. Go and put him in a convent school. He says, why? Because we will teach your child. It's mentioned in Sai Muslim. The difference between Iman and Kuf is Salah. Maybe your child after three, four years will call you a Kafir. Therefore, don't put him in a school. Put them in a convent school. They said, no, we want admission here. We will offer Salah. We will offer five times Salah. Then they give it in writing. <laughs> so it's compulsory that 100% of the parents, they give in writing that they will offer Salah five times. Believe me, we did not know that we could actually pressurize the parents or blackmail them. When the Christian missionaries are blackmailing our Muslim children, our Muslim parents in Bombay, they are paying 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds to get admission. And after paying that money as bribe, every day our children are doing shirk. They are saying, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God. So when the Christian missionaries can force them to do shirk, why can't we force to do something with this further? 
And believe me, we have been very successful. We know it is not allowed by this government and that government, but Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah. So, MashaAllah, even the multimillionaire, he waits for the interview. We tell him the interview will take time. Be prepared at least four or five hours, and you will be interviewed for about one and a half to two hours. And MashaAllah, we have a big questionnaire, and we explain to them the concept of the school. And we tell them that the satellite television is a big shaitan. So the cable TV, satellite TV should not be in your house. TV is not haram, but the cable TV, the satellite TV is a big shaitan. And normally we find that, we know that in the Western statistics, the average in America, a child sits in front of the TV for approximately seven hours on average, more time than he spends in school. Even in India, they spend several hours. And what happened, you know, when we say that if you want admission, you remove the cable TV. And mashallah, they have to do it, otherwise no admission. So because they want, they may not be practicing Muslims, but they have that jazba, they have the iman, they want to put in the school. And now it has become a status. Oh, my son got admission into IIS, status. Alhamdulillah. Allah has given us that status. So to get admission means it's the status. I got admission in Islamic International School. I passed the interview. So then we realized that once the cable TV is out and it's compulsory that the parents, the mother, should attend every week our Islamic lectures, compulsory, at least once. Father, twice a month, compulsory. If you don't have time, then no admission. So even the parents are being ingrained. It's a package. We are not only training the students, we are even training the parents. We don't want that we train the child, and after 13 years, the father says, OK, now go and do business. OK, start giving bribe, etc." So we want to see to it. We don't want to pour water or drugs back. Chances are that 50% we will lose our children, because finally the parents control them. So we even change the parents. And if we know that the business the parent is doing is not good, we'll tell you. There are some people who have got businesses. Maybe they're working in bank. I will tell them, working in bank is haram. Maybe your child, once after four or five years, he will cause you trouble. So see to it, you change your job fast. So knowingly very well. Yet they want to put their children in our school. And the point to be noted here is that after a few months, then the husband comes and tells us, you know my wife, she has stopped watching TV, now she gives me more time. So even the family life improves. We have got stipulated conditions before admission that minimum 20 minutes every day, there should be a family reading of the Quran along with translation. Every day, compulsory. The father should attend twice a month our lectures in which we talk about Islam, the mothers once a week. So in this way, mashallah, even the environment becomes Islamic. Then besides the parents, even the other siblings come, even the grandparents come. So it is rather changing the society. And we found that when we visited the Western schools, I'd gone to South Africa, and I'd gone to one of the best schools in South Africa about six years back. I don't want to name the school. The principal of the school told me that, Brother Zakir, we are at the mercy of the parents. We have to force them to come and take admission, though our fees is half than the other private schools, but then they blackmail us. If you tell us too many things, then we'll go to the government school. We'll go to the white school. And he told me, our students in the eighth standard, ninth standard girls, one evening, we went to a hotel and we found our girls wearing mini skirts and shorts and dancing. Imagine, one of the best schools in South Africa. And the parents were called, the parents are blackmailing. If you get too strict, we'll take out our children from here. Here in our school, we blackmail the parents. But natural for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, the school is not a business. So what fees we take, we are spending from our own pocket. So it's not a business, please don't get me wrong. The school, IRF always does everything free. The school is the first thing we are charging money. But even those who are paying full fees, we are subsidizing the fees. So in this way, mashallah, we want to create a new society. And what we feel that most of the organization that start, it's a one-man show. After the person goes away, the whole thing goes down. Most of the Muslim organization you see, it's a one-man show, that person goes away, the organization falls down. So we see to it that we require backups. At present, mashallah, in a foundation, Islamic Research Foundation, we have more than 15 speakers, mashallah, besides myself. And some of them travel in different parts of the world. They have been to UK, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, South Africa, several places, mashallah. 
And these children, mashallah, they are our future generation. And if you see the annual day that we have, in the annual day when we have skits, normally most of the other schools, they have fancy days where a person, maybe he may dress up like Michael Jackson or may dress up like maybe Sunil Gavaskar or whatever it is. Here, in our concert, mashallah, one person becomes, he imitates Sheikh Sudesh, one like Sheikh Ahmed Didad, you know. In this way, mashallah, we find that the role models of our children, the present age role models for our children, they are not these pop stars and pop singers and film actors. They are like Sheikh Sudesh, like Sheikh Ahmed Didad, Brother Bilal Phillips. So here we find that we should ingrain in our children that what should they become when they grow up. And mashallah, if you see that these children, they are taught public speaking right from junior KG. From the age of four, they are taught to stand in front of the microphone. And they are taught how to speak on the microphone. Most of our speakers, I'm sorry to say, they don't know public speaking techniques. What should be the distance from the mic? How is the modulation? How it should go up? How it should come down? The gestures, the eye to eye contact. See, when a person gives a speech on the stage, the matter he speaks carries only 7% marks. How much? 7%. 93% is presentation skills. How do you modulate? Your gestures, your eye-to-eye -eye contact. That's the reason today, actually I'm handicapped. The sound system is not good. It is like you're sending a warrior to a battlefield without weapons. We should be trained that how we should be able to dawah. The children, right from the age of four, they're trained public speaking in English as well as Arabic. So we want that a future generation that they should be trained, alhamdulillah. So this was a vision with which we started the school not knowing whether we would be successful or not. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been so much helpful and grateful that we got application from different parts of the world, from different cities in India. We have got application to start the school in Saudi Arabia, in UAE, in Yemen, in UK, in USA, several applications. So far, we have only started one more branch in Chennai. And our criteria are very strict, mashallah. So inshallah, we feel that every few years, we'll open one school so that it will be role model for the others. One thing we have to realize that for success, we have to follow the guidance of the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And always, we have to be professional. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahl, chapter 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, فَاسْأَلُوا أَحَالِ الزِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ If you don't know, ask the person who's knowledgeable. Ask the person who possesses the message. We as a policy in our organization, Islam Research Foundation, though we are a very small organization, it was started 15 years back. Alhamdulillah, we are only one employee. Now we are more than 400 employees, full-time paid employees. We always believe that we should be professional. And all the people that we employ, mashallah, we have a policy that whatever they're drawing in Bombay, if they join an organization, we give them more. We don't believe that if you're getting about 20,000 rupees, so come here for 50%, 10,000 rupees for last sake. If you're getting 20,000 rupees, we'll give you 25,000. If you're getting 30, we'll give you 35. If you're giving 50, we'll give you 60. But then you work, you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want the parents phoning me up, the doctors asking, I gave an Islamic lecture, and now my son is earning half. If I give him more, even the parents are with me. Even in our school, Islamic International School, that as far as the teachers, we have got strict conditions even for the teachers. And initially, I'm a nightmare even for the parents. I'm a nightmare even for the teachers. We have so many rules and regulations. Someone called us the Al-Qaeda school. <laughs> Qaeda means we have too many rules and regulations. And our teachers, mashallah, on an average, we interviewed about two and a half thousand teachers and selected less than 25, or 0.1% the selection. Similarly, for our Qaris, the Qaris we selected, we interviewed in different parts of India, Lucknow, Nadwa, various parts, Surat, our crew went. And there too, we interviewed more than 4,000 Kurras. And now we have over 40 Qaris we have. So our selection procedure, it is very strict. Less than 1% of the people we interview, we take them as our staff. And once we take the staff, 
the staff, we pay them more than what they get outside. We give an open ad in the newspapers that if selected, we will pay you more than what you're drawing. The ad says like that. If selected in our school, we will pay you more than what you're drawing. Irrespective of what you're earning, in any convent school if you're teaching, we keep only Muslim teachers, mashallah. And here, the teachers, instead of coming for five days, they have to come six days a week. Five days to teach our children. Our school works from Monday to Thursday and on Saturday. We have Friday and Sunday holidays, which was very difficult. Everyone objected initially that how is this unconventional Friday and Sunday? Nowhere do we have in the world. I said we have it in IIS. And mashallah, in the long run, it was beneficial. Now the children are fresh to study twice a week, on Saturday and Monday. In the normal school, they're fresh only on Monday. Here they're fresh twice a week, on Saturday as well as Monday. And in our school, we have got no homework. Whatever is taught is taught in the school. If there are some children who take late admissions, and if they have missed on the Arabic, they have to come on Sundays, extras from 8 to 1 every Sunday, to catch up absolutely free. And our teachers, they come five days to teach from Monday to Thursday and Saturday. And on Friday, they come to be taught. We educate our educators in our school. Our teachers, they get training. Once a week, they have the best of professionals coming to train them. These professionals, they are very well qualified in the field. They may be psychologists, they may be psychiatrists, they may be child counselors, they may be nutritionists, top people, Indian foreigners, they may be people, top non-Muslims. We pay them through the noses. We have workshops on Fridays, and we train the teachers even in voice and accent. The voice and accent training we give, we spend lakhs of rupees so that they have a neutral accent. And in Bombay Channel, in a non-Muslim news channel it came, the only school which has voice and accent from junior classes, IIS. So the specialized non-Muslim trainers come and train our teachers. They, in turn, train the students. So our teachers also, mashallah, they have to work hard. We pay them, but they work hard. And we are very strict with our rules, mashallah. And we believe in professionalism. So what happened that by the time they stay in our school, they get trained. Same thing with Akari, same thing with Arabic gen teachers, same thing with lady teachers. And unless we are professional in our field, we will not get the results. And if we see the annual day that we had, the annual day, and we have shown that annual day even on satellite channel, moment we showed on the satellite channel the annual day of our children performing, we got applications from different parts of the world that we too want to open a similar school. Now, just a few months back, we had another annual day, which the cassette hasn't been released. It is 10 times better than the first one. And alhamdulillah, there if you analyze, it was for five hours. And only the children performed. No adult, no teacher even spoke a word. All the children from nursery to standard five, they performed. And even they themselves were the compare. They compared the program professionally. Mashallah, they were the compares. They handled everything. Not a single teacher even spoke a word. No one spoke. For five hours, without a break, the audience was glued to the seat. Glued. Five hours, imagine. Our children, from the age of three and a half to 11 and a half, they glued the audience for five hours, mashallah. And what we did, we did not spend a great deal of time. We hardly trained them for three to four weeks. That's it. And in the first week, it was two hours a day. Second week was three hours a day, then half a day. Last week was three-fourth a day. So they lost about two weeks of the school on an average, nine working days. But we saw to it that we got professionals. We had professional choreographers. What our Islamic step that we had taken? And when we had the show, we had a Dawa conference, an international Dawa conference, where our students, mashallah, as I mentioned earlier, the Dawa conference was started by the recitation of Sheikh Sudesh. So one of the students dressed up as Sheikh Sudesh. Then we had Dr. Isra Ahmed giving a speech in Urdu. Then we had Bilal Phillips coming. Then other speakers, Brother Abdur Rahim Green. Then there was a person like Sheikh Ahmed Didad. Then my son dressed up like Dr. Zakir Naik. The point to be noted was that we had professional people to do makeup from the film industry. And the person who had done, if you know about Amitabh Bachchan, who had done the beard for Amitabh Bachchan in Shane Shah, you know? Shane Shah, though we don't encourage people seeing movies, but I was told that the person who did the beard for Amitabh Bachchan in Shane Shah, 
He was a Muslim. He happened to be my friend. So we had them, mashallah. And the makeup, if you see, I doubt you might have seen anywhere else that young children of the age of 10 years, 11 years, the way they performed. And my son, he copied the speech, five minute section of my speech, which I gave in London last year. When I'd come in December for the Global Unity of Peace, the talk I gave at the Excel Theater. And mashallah, you see, same type of beard, same cap, same coat, the actions. So the teachers trained them, the gestures, the way they walk, the way they come to the mic, the way they adjust the microphone, everything. Similarly with all the other speakers. If the speaker sits and speak, our children also sat and spoke. And there were various skits. So if you see the drama, if you see the full five hours, you find children right from the age of three and a half to about nine and a half performing. And there was one section where a person is speaking. The various languages we teach in our school, English, Arabic, Marathi, Hindi, Urdu, you could see in the skit that our children, mashallah, are so fluent in all these languages that really impresses the people. But one thing you realize that we should believe in professionalism. And if you see in our school, we have all types of Muslim taking admission. Hanafi, Shafi, Medalbi Salafi, Ahle Hadid, Jamaat Islami, Tabliki, Deobandi, Barevli. But we say, in our school, we follow Quran and Sunnah. And we take in writing that we will teach what is mentioned in Quran and Sai Hadith. And we make it very clear. We do not believe in dividing Muslims into different sects. Islam is against that, Quran is against that. Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 159, that if anyone makes sects in of Islam, it is haram. Oh, Prophet of Allah, we have nothing to do with him. So in spite of this, we have the children of the heads of the different Jamaats. Jamaat Islami, Tablighi Jamaat, all wanting admission, mashallah. So you really feel and you see a cross-section of the Muslim Ummah, the rich class, the middle class, the poor class, the different people. And people come from far away areas where they even have to travel two and a half hours. They come from length and breadth of Bombay. The school is in center of Bombay. People come from Mira Road, from Mumra. They travel two and a half hours up, two and a half hours down. And some of the parents, when the child is very young, they have to travel eight hours, two hours up and down to drop, two hours up and down to pick up. So here we find that once we give quality, people are bound to come to you. One thing is the Muslim Ummah wants Islamic education, but I, believe me, I would not put my son in any of the Muslim schools in Bombay if my school wasn't there. Not that I hate Muslims. I like them, but I want my child to get proper education. So the only option I had was to start a school. So here we realize that there should be demand. And whatever activity we do, we always say there should be 10 times minimum more number of people wanting to take part than the number of seats you have. Always. If there's a demand, then mashallah, you can provide quality and you can get the best out of the people because they know they have got admission out of a great difficulty. So what we say they follow. If you get easy, if it's a walkthrough, then they take it for granted. And to have this model somewhere else, there are many people who copied uh, all our syllabus is absolutely, anyone can copy it free, no problem. But many people copied, hardly anyone came even close to 5% of what we are doing. Because the main thing is not the syllabus, main thing is the management. Copying the syllabus is very easy. You can't take a syllabus from a good American or a British school and think you can match it. Main thing is how well you control it, how well you handle it. The management is very important. The management, the teachers, the parents, all put together. There should be a combination of everything. Everyone should have faith in each other. Then only will you really be able to make a difference. And once you have the confidence of the parents, inshallah, you can do wonders. So many a times we introduce many things, mashallah. Always there has been cooperation. So unless you don't have quality, you will not be able to achieve what you're opting for. And this is the principle of Islam too. That we believe in quality, anything we do. So inshallah, what we want, that our next generation that they should have that love with Allah's Karam. So mashallah, if the Arabic is strong, unlike us, if the Arabic is strong, they can understand the Quran directly, they can implement on the message, and they can educate the others. Keeping this in mind, mashallah, we started the school, and with Allah's help, alhamdulillah, we never imagined that we could achieve whatever we have achieved. It's basically Allah's help. Whatever we are doing in IRF, in Bombay, when we look back, we could not have dreamt of doing these things. And the best example is myself. During childhood, I used to stammer. And I was in a medical college. 
I could have thought of becoming the best doctor in my dream. In your dream, you can dream of anything. No one can stop you. But even in my dream, I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people because I was a stammerer. If you had asked me, what is your name? My name is Da, 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 Kid. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his help. What he has transformed in me, it's a miracle. Now I speak in front of tens and 20,000 people, 100,000 people. Largest audience I've addressed live is one million. Live, not on television, no, live. One million. And in India, mashallah, audience is always 40,000, 50,000. And the way we manage on time, we have 500 to 1,000 volunteers. Our volunteers, and when we call a guest speaker, there you see that when Dr. Isar Ahmed was called, not a single volunteer even shook hands with Dr. Isar Ahmed. Not that they didn't like him. They are trained. They are trained that mujahid. They can't shift away from the duty. They have to do their duty. And then only will you get result. Everyone, we have got volunteers, doctors, engineers, mashallah, more than a thousand volunteers we have in Bombay. So whatever we do, we do professionally. That's the reason in our audiences, more than 25% are non-Muslims. More than 25%. When we have 40,000 audience, more than 10,000 are non-Muslim. More than what Muslims can gather here, we have non-Muslims there coming for our talks. Even on satellite, mashallah, there's a great percentage of non-Muslims watching our programs, and they appreciate, mashallah. So I would like to leave the floor open for the question and session. I would like to end this talk of educating the educators, which was the main theme of this conference. And I chose Harrow, though I'm giving talks on every venue, different talks. I don't believe in giving the same talk every time. So I chose this when you harrowed the main theme, Educate the Educators and Harrow. And we leave the floor open for the question and session. I would like to end my talk with the question of the glorious Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse 81, where Allah says, وَقُلْ جَعَلْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ When truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood, it's by its nature bound to perish. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Now we enter into the next part of our program, which is the open question and answer session which is the most interesting part of Dr. Zakir Naik's program. And it's also very interactive. And the audience will get the chance to interact with the speaker and ask questions on whatever Dr. Zakir Naik has spoken in this talk. To analyze today's topic adequately for the audience present here today in the limited time available, we would like the following guidelines to be followed during the question answer session. Kindly state your name and profession before asking the question. You can ask the question on the topic as well as any question on Islam and comparative religion. For your second question, you have to go back of the row and uh, await your second chance to ask a question. Non-Muslim brothers and sisters present here in the audience will be given first preference. And I will request the volunteers who are on the mics that please check up if there are any non-Muslim brothers or sisters in the queue, then please give them first preference and give them the first chance to ask the question. Uh, we have two mics here, one for the sisters on my right and one for the brothers on my left. May we have the first question from the brothers on mic number one. My name is Mohammed Kabeya and I'm an A-level student. I know your profession and your specialty is in comparative religion, so my question is going to be on Christianity. Um, a lot of Christians say that Jesus is God. Um, can you articulate any evidence uh, using the Bible to refute this claim? Um, thank you very much. Brother, I have the question that many Christians claim that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God. So can you refute this from the Bible? Before I give the answer, I would like to make a few points clear. That Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern-day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he was the Messiah translated Christ. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Muslim and the Christians, we are going together. But there is parting of ways. There are many Christians or most of the Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. But if we read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. In the complete Bible, 
where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. If anyone, if any Christian can point out to me any single unequivocal statement from anywhere in the Bible, from any version where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself says unambiguously, unequivocally that I am God or where he says worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. When we read the Bible, we come to know that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I with the Spirit of God cast out devils. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I, with the finger of God, cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. He never claimed divinity. It's clearly mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that the words that you hear are not mine, but my Father's who has sent me. And it's mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him, and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him, and you are witness to it. So here, when we read the Bible, you come to know that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. He never said he was God. Neither he said that he was a begotten son of God. But he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. I've got many questions on the chicks, but uh, Dr. Zakir always prefers if people can come up to the mic and ask questions, and questions written on the papers or paper slips will be given second preference. So please come on the mic and ask questions. That would be preferable. The brother asked the question that I live in a predominantly Hindu society. Does it affect my work? Yes, it does. It helps me to strive harder, mashallah. It does affect. The place where I come from, Bombay, it is supposed to be one of the most difficult places where you can do dawah. The Bombay city, if anyone knows, one of the most difficult places where a person can do dawah. The organization, the political organization that are there, they are so much against the Muslims. But Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 160, if Allah helps you, then none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there, then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah. So if Allah's help is there, it's very easy. Believe me, in Bombay, while doing dawah, even the life is in danger. That's what I'm aware of it. That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. Bombay is the most difficult place where you can do dawah. It's very difficult. Yet, in spite of living in such a situation, with Allah's help, it is very easy. Imagine I give talks from the past eight years on the cable TV network. We come on more than one million homes every day. Every day. And in that, we do hardcore dawah. Quoting the Vedas, quoting Bhagavad Gita, quoting the Upanishad, Mahabharat, talking about the scriptures, and alhamdulillah, when we give talks, Hindus also come in large numbers. And we train our people, mashallah. And the students that we have, and my colleagues, even they, mashallah, can quote Quran, Hadith, Bible, Veda, Raman, even our children in school, mashallah. If you see the young children in school, in the fifth standard, sixth standard, they can rattle off chapter number, verse number, mashallah, they're trained. Brother, normally you should realize we should follow the rules and the regulation of question answer session. It is not a discussion you are having between me and you. Fine? You are an elderly person. We wanted to get the mic to you. Only they to pochane pakarnache. The thing is there that if someone gives a finger, should not catch that. The rules and regulations are there. There are at least 15 people standing in the queue there. And one question you could have asked all the three questions together. While giving a talk, if you interrupt in between, this goes against the rules and regulations. And a Muslim is supposed to follow the rules and regulations if you are a Muslim. So you should ask together. 
Yes, you should ask together. Otherwise, you should ask one question, go behind the queue, and then ask. So you should wait for 15 people to finish, and then you can ask. Otherwise, it becomes a dialogue. Not that I cannot answer. Not I cannot answer. Regarding your last part, because the elderly person I'm answering, were we able to convert anyone? We don't convert anyone. Allah gives a daya. We cannot convert anyone. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Kisha, chapter number 88, verse number 21, Fazakrin namanta muzakkir. Our job is to deliver the message. It's Allah who gives hidayah. And alhamdulillah, Allah has given hidayah to thousands of non-Muslims, mashallah, to the IRF. We have been made the zariah. And if you see, and if you see our videotapes, mashallah, I've given a talk on similarities between Hinduism and Islam. And mashallah, when we have in Bombay, we only allow non-Muslims to ask questions. Nowadays, Muslims only listen. Because Muslims are our people, they're not our guests, the non-Muslims are our guests. So mashallah, there's so many non-Muslims queuing up that even though we give two to three hours for question and session, we can't complete all the questions. And mashallah, many of them accept Islam on stage. And I was just there yesterday in Birmingham. There was a Muslim who told me that there's a Hindu in Leicester who's so much impressed with the talk that he wants me to come to Leicester. He wants to call all the Hindus of that area. He will finance everything. He wants to keep my talk, similarities between Hinduism and Islam. And inshallah, Allah may give him a also very shortly. So the thing is that we have to convey the message, Allah gives hidayah, but we should not be afraid. We should be on lines of Quran and Sunnah and deliver a message. Hope that answers the question. May we have the next question from the little sister standing over there. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mariam. My question is, if someone does something really bad, then what does Allah recommend in the Quran to give them a punishment? Sister, that's a very good question. That if someone does something bad, what is the punishment recommended by Allah in the Quran? Depending upon the sin done, we have to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got various ways of guiding the person. One of them, as you mentioned, is that if someone does a sin, then there is a punishment for that. On the other hand, that if you don't do that sin, then there's a reward for you. So one of the aspects is, if you don't do this, if you don't drink alcohol, there's a reward for you. If you don't rob, there's a reward for you. And the reward will be here, also in the akhirah. But the point to be noted, depending upon the sin, is the punishment given. But Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, and Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He pleases, He may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk He will never forgive. Shirk, associating partners with God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive. Any other sin, if He pleases, He may forgive. So we as Muslims, what we should do, that if we see someone doing sin, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, that if you see anything wrong, if you can stop it with the hand, stop it with the hand. If you cannot stop it with the hand, then stop it with the tongue. If you can't stop it with the tongue, the least you can do is curse in your heart, and then you will be the lowest level of mu'min believer. And Allah says that whenever we see something wrong, Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, Ta'miruna bil marufi wa tanhauna anil munkar. That enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. So if we as Muslims see someone committing a sin, we have to dawah and islah with that person and tell that person it's a sin, he should not do it, and try and convince him with Quran and Sunnah and with reason and logic. Hope that answers the question. Sir. I would again like to uh, request the non-Muslim brothers and sisters sitting in the audience to please come up to the mic and clarify your doubts and whatever misconception you have about Islam. This is your opportunity, so please, please, please come to the mic and ask questions. And again, the volunteers standing near the mics, I would again request them to please check up the queue. If there are any non-Muslims standing in the queue, bring them forward so that they get the first chance to ask a question. May we have the next question from the brothers standing over there. Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Chairman, Brother Naik, uh, I will explain who I am, but first, uh, thank you very much for your talk, and uh, just to let you know that you and Ahmed Didar are always in my prayers, I will always make dua for you, and uh, when it comes to public speaking, I always try to emulate you and Ahmed Didar, and it has helped uh, with the dawah. My name is Hassan, I'm a medical representative for a pharmaceutical company. I'm also involved in the political process. I, I stood for parliament last year, and inshallah, I plan to go further in my career. My question is relating to uh, educating extremists, uh, extremist youth. There is one organization uh, headed by a well-known scholar who branded myself as a kafir 
and other Muslims who uh, got involved in politics as kafirs. They use a Quranic verse which says that if anyone uh, legislates other than Allah, then he becomes a kafir. They use these Quranic verses. They also glorify the 9-11 uh, attacks. The question to you, Dr. Naik, is how do we educate these extremists who claim to follow the Quran and the Sunnah? So that was the question that there is extremist and the head of an organization who has labeled him kafir. They even glorify the bombing, a suicide bombing, even 9-11. So how do we educate these extremists? See, if you're talking about Muslim extremists, then brother, I call myself a Muslim extremist. I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely honest, I'm extremely just, I'm extremely merciful. What's wrong in being extremely kind? Quran says, be extremely honest. I can't be partly honest. So I'm an extremist Muslim. We don't have to go with the label the Western media puts. When they ask me, I say, yes, I'm an extremist. Extremely honest, extremely kind, extremely just, extremely merciful, extremely kind. What's wrong? And no Muslim can tell me that being extremely honest is wrong. The other people are partly honest, partly just. So what we have to do, that if you're an extremist Muslim, every Muslim should be an extremist, but extremist in the right direction, not in the wrong direction. We can't be extremely unjust, extremely dishonest. So if the media is telling that there are some Muslims who are extremists, I say every Muslim should be an extremist. Every Muslim should be a fundamentalist. If you're not a fundamentalist Muslim, then you're not a good Muslim. You're not a practicing Muslim. So what the media gives labels on us, we get apologetic. I'm not a fundamentalist, I'm not an extremist, so I'm an extremist. What you may be talking is about fanatics. The difference between a fanatic and an extremist. Now, I don't know who you're talking about, whether X, Y, Z. So my answer may be applicable to that person, may not be. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said that if any Muslim calls any other Muslim a kafir, then that comes back to him. That means he becomes a kafir. Who said our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam? So if you are a Muslim, and if someone calls you a kafir, the person calling you becomes a kafir according to the hadith of Muhammad Wasallam. Unless you have done an act of kufr, which he can really prove it, etc. Otherwise, the kufr comes back to him. Coming to the question that how can we educate those people who glorify these attacks? 9-11, London bombing, etc. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, if any person, Muslim or non-Muslim, kills any other human being, Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any other human being, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. So killing any innocent human being is haram. It's prohibited. We know that in 9-11, in the bombing of the New York Twin Towers, more than 3,000 innocent people were killed. In London bombing, more than 50 people were killed last year. Just last month in Bombay, 11th of July, 2006, more than 200 people were killed. Killing innocent people is haram. Anyone having even little bit knowledge of Islam cannot condone. These acts should be condemned as haram in Islam. But, but, there are many Muslims who have said this, especially in England and USA I've heard in front page, but why are you putting a full stop there? We also have to condemn the thousands of people who have been killed in Afghanistan, the thousands of people who have been killed in Iraq, the thousands of people who have killed in Bosnia, in Gujarat. Why do we stop there? When I asked a person in America, that why are you putting a full stop? But Brother Zakir, the situation is such we can't continue. What is the situation? Who are you afraid of? I live in Bombay, mashallah, a city and a country which we know that the life is in danger, but Allah is, mashallah, there to protect me. Alhamdulillah. And why do you put a full stop where there's no full stop? Why? More people have been killed in Afghanistan than London bomb blasts. More people have been killed in Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction. Did you find it? No. So why? So why are you keeping quiet? Who are you afraid of? Why? In the same breath, we have to condemn it. No, but the time is not right. What the time is not right? So we have to realize what is wrong has to be condemned. What happened in Gujarat has to be condemned. And if the people who are responsible for any evil act, if you catch that person and punish him, no problem. You can't catch an innocent person. 
If someone has killed in Gujarat, you do a bomb blast in Bombay. Why? Because the same community. Islam doesn't permit that. Imagine those innocent people who have been killed in the bomb blast in Bombay or London or New York. Those innocent people, their relatives, they'll become permanent enemies of those people who have done this. Yet the British government has not found out who did the London bomb blast. Yet no one knows who did the Bombay bomb blast. I'm not telling you Muslims have done it. Anyone who has done it, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, has to be condemned. A true Muslim, <laughs> a true Muslim who believes and submits evil to Allah will never do the act. If someone is caught with a Muslim name, he may be a pseudo-Muslim, may have a name Abdullah, Sultan, Zakir, Muhammad, that's a different question. If it happens to be whether he is a Muslim or non-Muslim, he has to be condemned. If suppose, imagine, if suppose certain Muslims think it is right, the relatives of the thousands of innocent people who have been killed, they'll become permanent enemies of Islam. How can we condone it? It's haram. What wrong have they done? What wrong have the people who were traveling in the trains in Bombay have done? The people who were there in the marketplace or in the tube where the bomb blast took place in London. So what wrong did they do? If you really can catch the culprit and punish him, no problem, do it. If you can't do it, then don't kill innocent people. Islam does not agree with that. And I gave a talk, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly in Birmingham, NEC? And there I've told that if you go to the US site, US Department of Justice on Info, please, if you go on that site, there are many terrorist organizations, more than 50% are Muslims, out of which Ulfa, India, had done 749 attacks in the last 16 years, more than any other terrorist organization, that organization is not mentioned there. Why? Al-Qaeda has mentioned 28 attacks, all suspects, none proved. Ulfa, 749 attacks, all proven. That is not there on their side. These acts should be condemned. We cannot kill innocent people, so you have to realize that whoever is telling that these acts are correct, they are totally against the Quran and Sunnah. Ask them for proof. Know what the Quran says. If the culprit is caught, and if he's punished, that's fine. But you can't kill innocent people. Thank you very much. I'm still receiving many questions on slips from the sister's side. Uh, let me remind them that if they want their question to be answered by Dr. Zakir, then you have to come on the mic and ask questions. Please, sisters, come on the mic and ask questions. Thank you. Maybe the next question from the sister. Dear Brother Zakir, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm greatly honored today that uh, I've got an opportunity uh, directly asking you a question. Uh, although until now, I've, I'm only watching your DVDs, and I'm a great fan of your uh, topics. My question is directly related to the topic that is educating our children. My question is that in a proper Muslim education system, should any importance be given in teaching our children about the national identity or emphasis should be only in religious identity? Don't you think that by not teaching our children about their own country's history, uh, the, how it was formed and how we got freedom from the colonial powers, they will lack essential knowledge about history of their paternal roots and how I IS, that is your school, which have students from all parts of the world, you are coping with this side of education. Are you teaching only Islamic history or are equipping their minds with ample knowledge about their own respective countries as well? Thank you. Sister has a question that in an ideal Islamic school, should we even teach about the country, about the national activity, about national history? about the freedom fight, and how are we coping in IS? As far as the general answer is concerned, that in an Islamic school, we should even talk about the country. There's no problem at all. We can talk about the laws of the country, we can talk the rules and regulation of the country, but, but we have to realize that number one, our allegiance goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should not go against the country unless the law of the country goes against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the law of the country does not go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to follow each and every law of the country. As far as India is concerned, I am aware that there is not a single rule in the constitution of India which forces any Muslim to do any haram activity. Neither does it prohibit you from doing anything which is fard. For example, the Indian government doesn't say that drinking alcohol is fard. Optional. 
So they don't force you to do anything which is haram, neither do they prohibit you to do something which is fard. Salah is allowed. In fact, they have a separate Muslim personal law. So I would say that among the non-Muslim countries in the world, I would put India to be among the top. One of the best countries where Muslim can live. I may disagree with certain policies. So I say I am a very good Muslim as well as a very good practicing Indian. But if any law of any country, whether it be India, whether it be UK, USA, Singapore, if it contradicts with the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more because he is our creator. He has given us life. Our country has been beneficial to us. May have given us certain things, job, etc. But nothing compared to our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more. So if they don't contradict, we have to follow all the rules and regulations. If certain rules and regulations contradict, that particular thing we need not follow. So we have to teach our children to be good citizens also. What's wrong? He should be a good Muslim. So he should follow the rules and regulations as long as it doesn't contradict Islam. As far as history is concerned, of course. What we do, that we see to it, sometimes some history which is not relevant, we don't teach. So then it's at our liberty, we teach the history which is required. In our school, Islamic International School, we have children who are actually British nationals, but they have parents. Parents also British, maybe the grandparents are Indian, the origin is Indian. So we have students from USA, from UK, from Saudi, from other parts of the world. But basically all have got Indian origin, all of them. So you can call them Indians or you can call them many are foreigners. But, but, but we have selected the world history. We have option of taking Indian history or world history. The world history we felt has got more scope for us for doing dawah. It talks about the lifestyle of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, about Moses, peace be upon him. So it's two in one. So we select the world history. We have two options, world history and history. In world history, part of India also comes. So what is required, we teach. And as far as the government is concerned of that country, we should be very bold. What is right, we have to agree. We can't say, because it's a non-Muslim government, I'm against it. For what? If the policy is against the policy of Allah, we are against it. If it's for, we have to agree. Even if the enemy is, no problem. We have to be bold. That's what Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 81. وَقُلْ جَا لَكْ وَذَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَوْكَ When truth is all again falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. So we should see to it that in educating, we have to give them even the world history, what's happening in the world, so that when they go out, they should be aware. But some things which may not be relevant, like some things are taught which we feel will not be useful for them. They will never require it in the full life. So that portion we delete. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Yaullah. I am a worker. I got a two questions. First of all, I'm going to tell you I love you because the way you are speaking about Islam is terrific. It's very nice. And my first question is, the place where I'm working is like if half and half, is it like halal food is selling there and haram as well, like khinzir, pig, these things. If I'm working there about relating over the money which I'm receiving, what do you think about that? Is that halal for me? Is there any sin on me? Oh, the second question is uh, because when I start to see your uh, lecturing, I wish in my heart that when I see you face to face, I would like to give you a heart. Can I come to the stage and give you a heart? <laughs> Brother has a question that he works in a place which serves food. Part of it is halal, part is haram. And the thing to be noted that, is it a business which sells food? Or are you working in a place, an office, which sells food for the staff or employees? So is it an office? No, no, I'm just a staff. Yes, if you're working in a shop which sells haram food and halal food, if the haram food is in a very small minority, you know, maybe the gross turnover, the haram food may be 1% or 2%, then there can be possibilities, but if, quite a large portion is haram food, then you should not work in that shop. It's haram. You can't work in an alcohol shop. You can't work in a shop which sells pork. If you're working in a five-star hotel, which has got lodging, boarding, everything, and part, the food is a small portion of the income. And in that food, maybe 50% is haram, then it may be fine. 
working in a five-star hotel with the main income is lodging, boarding, part of it is food. In that part, maybe pork is haram, alcohol is haram, etc. So in that case, it will be permissible. But if you're working in a shop which sells only food, and if majority of the food, more than 50% or even quite a large portion, 25% or 20%, I mean, there's no percentage per se. But if it's selling haram food and we're involved in selling that, then working in that shop becomes haram, brother. Hope that answers the question. As soon as possible, you change your profession. Take a job, inshallah, Allah will give you. Try and find a better job, and that will be better for your risk also and for your akhir also. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sagal. I'm in year six. And my question is, how can we start educating ourselves in the deen so we may educate others in the ummah? And what is the basic we should know? This is the question that how should we educate ourselves so that we educate others? What should we know basically? But natural knowledge is such a thing that it's a big ocean. But the best book for guidance is the glorious Quran. I would ask you to read the translation of the glorious Quran. That's the best. This is the best book of guidance. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is the most positive book in the world. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It is a warning to the heedless. It's a guide to the erring. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering and a hope to those in despair. The best book that anyone can read for guidance is the glorious Quran. I have a question from a non-Muslim sister on the slip. It says, I'm a non-Muslim girl, and I'm considering to revert to Islam. But would this mean my God in my religion will punish me? MashaAllah, there's a non-Muslim sister who is thinking of accepting Islam. May Allah give her that, and we welcome you to the fold of Islam, alhamdulillah. Her main question is that once she accepts Islam, will her God punish her? Sister, in all religions, including Islam, God is only one. There's only one same God for all the human beings. There's no different God for Muslim and Christian and Hindu and Sikh and Jews. There's one same God. And I've given the talk on concept of God in the major world religions. And all the religions say that God is one. He doesn't have any images. He's not begotten. He's all powerful. So the God is the same. So if you accept Islam and all the religions say, if you read most of the major religions, their scriptures say that there is a messenger to come whose name shall be Muhammad. Whether you read the Jewish scripture, the Christian scripture, the Hindu scriptures, I don't know whether you're a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu, but whichever religion you belong to, inshallah, most probably, even in your religious book, it will be mentioned God is one. It will be mentioned that there is a messenger to come whose name is Muhammad, and he will guide you to the truth, peace be upon him. So even that God, it's the same God, not a different God. If you accept Islam, Islam means submitting your will to God. So inshallah, that God will be very happy and he will reward you. And inshallah, in your next life, he will give you Jannah. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Kamran Qureshi, company director. Uh, brother, Jazakallah for coming today. Uh, my question is that, uh, mashallah, you've established a model Islamic school, one that I would envisage in an Islamic state. Uh, but mashallah, you've established in today's world. My question is, unfortunately, tens of millions of Muslim children would not be so fortunate to go to schools like yours. Uh, what do you recommend for our children and all over the world, the Muslims, who cannot have these type of schools? And also, are all your speeches uh, and details of the school on your website? Jazakallah. So, brother, the question that everyone will not be fortunate to study in that school. So how can people, millions of Muslims throughout the world, what should they do for children? How can they get a similar school? And as far as the information of our school, yes, if you go to our website, irf.net, in that website you'll see a separate section for Islamic International School. You can go there and you can get the information. As far as similar schools, there are two options. The first option is very easy, that people can come see our school, whatever cooperation they want we can give, they can come and start in the city a similar school. But the success is very difficult. For everyone who says he wants to start a school, they may not have the same management skill. They may not have that same passion. All these differ, and the main is Allah's help. So if Allah helps you, inshallah, it's possible. So one thing is that you can start a similar school, which many people have, but so far, all those people who have started, as I told you, that close to about 5%, 6% of what I would consider. We also have franchise, but the requirement for franchise is very difficult, very strict. 
We require land, we require all, everything. It should be funded by the local people. The thing should be funded by the local people. Our criteria are very strict. If we want any part anywhere else in India, we want minimum four acres land. If it's on the sub of the city, two acres. If it's in the heart of the city, we require half the construction cost, everything else we'll do. Various rules and regulations. In spite of that, we have got hundreds of offers. We first thought we will open one school every year, but then we decided that it's difficult. But once we started the school, we realized to manage was so difficult, we had to fly in and out from Bombay to Chennai. We send our teachers for training, we send our counselors, everything. So we realized that it's possible, but it's difficult. So therefore, we said that every two, three years we start. We have plans next time to start in Dubai, inshallah. There have been offers in Dubai where people said that we will give you land. There are people even in UK who have told us. There was a person in Manchester told me, I can give you five acres land. We haven't taken the offer yet. We scrutinize the person offering and everything. And if we feel it's feasible, it's not a commercial venture. Point number one, the person donating that land, we say you give it and forget it. Don't think of getting a return. In the Western countries, everyone is thinking, if I invest 1,000 pounds, how much will I get? See, wherever I go, it's only in the Western countries, in USA, Canada, and UK, where there's tickets. There's nothing the concept of ticket for talk. How can I have a ticket for Islamic talk? So there's no concept of getting tickets. People call me, they say, Dr. Zakir Naik, how much will you charge to come? I mean, they cannot afford me, believe me. If I have to tell my fees, they can't afford me. Mashallah, come, you're free. Maximum, you can pay my ticket. My crew, everything has come, absolutely, Mashallah. It's all paid by us. Fine. Simple accommodation if you can. If not, we manage it, no problem. My time is more important. So this concept is different. They are in the eastern part of the world, Mashallah. It's different. So what we do, it is not a commercial venture. So anyone interested, if he gives, he has to forget it. He gives something for the land. He puts school, we control it. If we have a franchise, we have full control. We also tell in India, the person who donated, he donated a land, someone donated a land which cost about 16 crore rupees. It will be how much? Maybe some million pounds worth of land. But we told him, no guarantee that your child will be admitted. You can give the land, you can start the school, but no guarantee if your child passes, he'll get admission. There have been cases that people have given us maybe a million dollar donation. One child was refused, I'm very strict. So our conditions are very absolutely transparent. So if such conditions there, we scrutinize the person who's doing. When we have a franchise, we see to it that once the name is attached, if IRF name is attached, finish. We see to it that we keep up to our name. As a policy, when we go anywhere else, we tell them, don't put our name. We will come, but don't put my name. Don't put my name as organizer. The moment you put the name as organizer, that means there's surely going to be problems for us. So when we go and support any other organization for any function, we support a lot, mashallah. But the only criteria of ours is, we'll help you, but don't put our name. Because we know we don't have 100% control. Even 50% control, we don't agree. 90% also, we don't agree. Unless we have 100% control, we don't agree putting our name as organizers or sub-organizers. The name comes, that means, so if someone, there are offers, mashallah, from different parts of the world for us to start such schools. And one thing, when the name is attached, inshallah, we are going to start in Dubai, we will keep the fees more than the British schools and the American schools, inshallah. We'll compete with them. We'll keep higher fees than them. There are people who can afford when Allah has given them. Those who can't afford, we'll give 25%, people will give scholarship. So in Dubai, inshallah, is our next target, where the fees, there's quite high, of the British schools and American schools. But inshallah, we have plans to keep fees higher than them. And inshallah, there'll be more people flocking to our school, inshallah, with Allah's help. And main thing is the quality. For other people, you can start in your own capacity, whatever you have. I know that here, mashallah, the government funds schools also. But we don't normally take funding from the government because there's too much of interference, not a single penny. Here, I don't know if you can take and run the school the way we are running, no problem. Or you start on your own. Start on your own, small way, whatever way you can. Whatever ability you have got, start and make a beginning. Whatever you can do, at least scratch the surface, inshallah. And inshallah, Allah will help you and you will inshallah, be successful. Hope that answers the question. May we have the next question from the sister. Um, I've got a question from a non-Muslim sister. She's asking, um, a number of verses in the Quran are cancelled out by others. Can these not be viewed as inconsistencies or contradictions? For example, chapter 4, verse 15, abrogated by chapter 24, verse 2. 
sister has asked the question, the non-Muslim sister, that there are some verses of the Quran which are abrogating or contradicting. It's cancelled. So does it mean that, how can there be a contradiction? If you read the Quran, there are no two verses in the Quran which contradict. I challenge anyone to point out any two verses in the Quran which contradict. Allah says clearly in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 82, Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرَانَ وَلَوْ قَانَا مِنْ إِنْدِي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِي اِكْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. Now, in the Muslim Ummah, I'm aware, there is a concept of abrogation, theory of abrogation, known as mansuk and nask, based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 106, and Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 101, which says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not cause any of his ayat, any of his signs to be forgotten. He substitutes it with something better or similar. Now, based on this verse, there are many scholars who have propounded the theory of abrogation, Nask and Mansuk. People will say, what is Dr. Zakhani talking about? No, that no verse is contradict. The Quran says the verse will not contradict. It will not contradict. Any scholar says anything, I'm not bothered. Allah is the highest, number one. Now, if you read the verse of the Quran, you can analyze the verse of the Quran in two ways. One way is that the ayahs talking in the Quran are referring to the earlier scriptures. Maybe Torah, maybe Injil. So Allah says, I do not cause any of the ayahs, the signs of Allah, the previous verses of the previous revelations, to be forgotten, but substituted with something better or similar. Something better and similar is the Quran. Now, if you agree that the ayat mentioned in the verse is ayat of the Quran, then too I have an answer. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed one verse of the Quran, what was relevant for that time, and after that he revealed another verse, but that verse is not contradicting, it is giving more information. And the two verses given by the sister of Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 15, and Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 2, though she hasn't mentioned the translation, and by Allah's grace, I know the translation of these verses. Not the Mahafuzul Quran. This is all training. It's not Mahafuzul Quran. It is practice that I know what questions are going to come to me. So we know the verses, mashallah. It's very easy, it's not difficult. You tell the verses, and even our children, mashallah, do the same. Alhamdulillah. Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 15 says that if anyone is caught in fornication, if any woman is caught in fornication, then keep her in custody in house arrest like. Seclude her until she dies or Allah ordains something else. And then Surah Noor chapter number 24, verse number 2 says that as for the fornicator, person who commits fornication, give them punishment of 100 lashes. Now, people will think, is there a contradiction? If the first Quranic verse of Surah Nisa chapter 4, 15 said that put the woman in house arrest and a full stop, then Surah Noor of 100 lashes would contradict. It says that keep them in house until they die or until Allah gives something else. Now, for this, Allah has given two options. In the Quran, for a fornicator, there's 100 lashes. And in the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, for the adulterer, the punishment is thrown into death. So this verse of the Quran does say that Allah will give some other punishment later on. If that part wasn't there, there would have been a contradiction. So there's no contradiction. It says that this punishment is temporary. Later on, Allah will reveal something else. Similarly, there are scholars who have written that there are 1,000 verses contradicting. Some scholars then came to 500. Siyuti, I think, came down to 22. Another scholar came down to 5. I have verified those 22 and 5 also. I have answered those also, alhamdulillah. And one of them is this. What we realize in Mansuk and Nask, what happens? That Allah, in some prohibitions, He has brought in stages. And the best example I give is of alcohol. The first verse to be revealed regarding alcohol is Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 219, where Allah says, in intoxicants, there is loss as well as profit. The loss is more than profit. This verse of the Quran does not prohibit alcohol. It only says in intoxicants there is loss and profit. The loss is more than profit. The next verse to be revealed of prohibition was Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 43 which says that do not pray with your mind befogged. When you're intoxicated, do not pray. That means it's a higher degree now. 
Previously, it did not say it was haram. It only gave you guidance. In intoxicant, there is loss and profit. Loss is more than profit. Next verse says, do not pray with your mind before. When you're intoxicated, you can't pray. Now, since a Muslim has to pray five times a day, indirectly, he can't have intoxicant the full day. In night, option is there. Not anything you should have. The final prohibition came in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuh al-lazina amanu, O you believe, innam al-khamru al-maisuru, most certainly intoxicated than gambling, wal anzabu al-azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich summan amili shaitan. These are certain handiwork. First, anibu lalukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Here, the final prohibition came. Now, when this verse was revealed, barrels of alcohol, intoxicants thrown on the streets of Medina never to be filled again. Then the final haram came. Now, if you analyze, many people say that the last verse of Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, has overruled Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 219. It's contradicting. It's not contradicting. It is giving more information. The first verse only told you there is loss and profit. Loss is more. Even today, the verse is applicable. That verse is even correct today. Even in intoxicants today, there is loss and profit. We as medical doctors know there is profit. But the loss is more than profit. The next verse says, don't pray when you're intoxicated. Even today, that is applicable. Today, you cannot pray when you're intoxicated. But the last final prohibition doesn't contradict. It encompasses. For example, I say that I live in UK. Fine. Then next day, I say, I live in London. Third day, I say, I live in Harrow. Now, moment I say Harrow, London and UK is understood. But my first answer, I live in UK, was a general answer. Then more specific, I live in London. When I say I live in Harrow, it is more specific. It's not contradicting my first answer. So the last prohibition that the alcohol is prohibited is not contradicting that in intoxicants there is loss and profit. It is yet there. It's not contradicting Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 43, that you cannot pray when your mind is befogged, when you're intoxicated. So this means there is more information. The last verse of the Quran, if you follow that, the earlier two is automatically followed. It's understood. So therefore, according to me, and according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is not a single contradiction in the Quran. If there were any contradiction, this book cannot be the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I disagree with anyone. Let him be the greatest scholar in the world. And I've challenged anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, to point out a single contradiction in the Quran. They will never do it and never will be able to do it. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mehdi Ahmadi. I'm a researcher in uh, history, political science, and I'm currently studying uh, in computer science. My question is, is pertaining to jadu or, or magic, or by, by whatever name you would like to address it, I won't go into specifics, but a certain family member recently found a piece of paper in which was supposedly some uh, elements of negativity, which they felt was of, of this nature. And uh, they themselves uh, indulged in similar practices to, um, to obtain a, uh, a remedy for it, believing that you know, this is wrong. I was wondering if we could um, shed some light on this matter. Well, there's a question that what do I have to say about black magic and what's the remedy? As far as black magic is concerned, there is something like black magic. The Quran mentions that in Surah Falak, mentions Surah Baqarah, there is black magic, it does exist. But we should not involve in black magic. We should not do it. We should have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as far as the remedy is concerned, the last two surahs, the Mu'azatain, Surah Falak and Surah Nas, were revealed for this. These two surahs are the remedy for black magic. Now, see, one thing is there that normally, whenever people think that something has possessed, first thing is Allah says, ask the person who has knowledge. Surah Nahl, chapter 16, verse 43. Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 7. Go to a doctor. If the doctor doesn't tell you the treatment or cannot treat the disease, go to a psychiatrist. Most of the people who claim to have black magic, they can be cured by doctors and psychiatrists. There can be possibilities that actually a jinn may have come and black magic may have taken place. So in that case, you can follow the guidance of Quran and Sunnah. You can go to a person who's an expert in this field, but I'm sorry to say most of the people who are experts in this field who claim more than 99% are fake. More than 99% are going to me. Huh? It is my analysis. More than 99% who claim that they can cure black magic, they are frauds. The moment you realize he's asking from you money, that means he's trying to make a fast buck. Do this, do that, give me so much money, 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds. 
He's trying to make a fast buck out of it. So there are people who are experts in this field. I know a couple of them in Saudi Arabia, mashallah, they're very knowledgeable. I don't know if anyone else other ways. So if he's knowledgeable, we should realize that if he gives the treatment from Quran and Sunnah, it is right. So we have to go to a specialist who specializes in the field. Hope that answers the question. Maybe I have the next question from the brothers over here. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir. My name is Shahid. I'm a salesman. Like most people, I love you as well. Uh, I'd just like to ask you the question. Could you define what Iman and Aqidah is? Because ultimately, we'd like to die with this uh, in this state. And also, um, how this can be attained? Is there only through Dawah? And if so, through which method of Dawah? Because there's so many different efforts. Uh, the question, what is the meaning of Iman? What is the meaning of Aqidah? And if Dawah, then which method of Dawah? Iman means belief. You can give a lecture on Iman for five hours or ten hours. So what? I don't know. You want to give me a lecture on that? I don't know. What do you mean Aqidah? I mean, do you have Aqidah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything? So you can give a lecture on Iman, you can give a lecture on Aqidah. No reason is because some people seem to say that the Prophet sallallahu was more than what he was. So ask the question, now you're asking what is Aqidah? Aqidah can give for ten hours without talking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also. Some people think that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is? More than a man or? Is more than a man. Yes, he's more than a man. He's the best human being that we have in the world. He's more than a common man. But, but, I know what the question is. But he is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a human being. He is far superior than any of us human beings. But he is Bashar. He is Bashar, the Quran says. He is like a human being. He requires to eat. He requires to sleep. And he is dead. He was dead in Medina. But he was one of the best exemplary Muslims, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Qalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, that verily thou art standeth on the highest standard of character. Quran says in Surah Hazab, chapter 33, verse number 21, verily in the Prophet you shall find the most beautiful pattern of conduct. So as a human being is the best exemplary Muslim, Alhamdulillah, but he was a prophet of God. When we worship, we have to worship Allah SWT directly. We don't have to go through anyone. We have to ask him directly and no one else. As far as how to do dawah, do dawah according to the Quran and Sunnah. As per the guidelines laid down in the Quran and Sunnah. And if you go to our website, irf.net, you'll find a lot of information on that. Hope that answers the question. I have a question from another non-Muslim brother. He is Yoginder Singh Maini. He seems to be a Sikh. And he asked that, can you please tell me the similarities between Sikhism and Islam? Our Sikh brother has asked a very important question, that what are the similarities between Sikhism and Islam? And there are a lot. Time will not permit me to expand on all. I'll just mention in brief a few things. That Sikhism, it's a religion of 10 gurus, for those who don't know. And it was founded by Guru Nanak Sahib in the late 15th century in the land of Punjab, in the land of Five Rivers. And Guru Nanak, he was very much influenced even by the Muslims. He was born in a Kshatriya family in a warrior class Hindu family. He was influenced by the Muslims, many Muslims. And the five Ks that the Sikh always maintain is the Kish, that is the uncut hair. It is the Kanga, it is the comb to keep the hair clean. It is the Kala, that is the bracelet. The fourth is the Kacha, the long underdraws. And the fifth, it is the Kirpan, it is the dragger. This is the identity, in short. This was a brief about a Sikh. So the moment, mashallah, you see a person wearing a turban, he's identified. Therefore, I always appreciate that the people who keep the label without any fear are the Sikhs. Therefore, if we hear my talk on if the label shows their intent, I tell the Muslims that mashallah, the Sikh, he's proud to be a Sikh. And he even fought with the Canadian government in the army. They said, you shave off that. He said, no, I will not. And he fought the case and they won. When I went to Canada the first time in 1996, it came as a headline that a Sikh fights the case in the Canadian army and he wins the case. But we Muslims, many of us, someone does something, we shave off the beard. Why? Now, coming to the similarities between the Sikhism and Islam, the sacred book of the Sikh is the Guru Granth, or known as Adi Granth. And if you read the first chapter of this Adi Granth, first volume, first chapter, first verse, it's called as Japuji. And it says that Almighty God, He is called as the true. He is the true not created, the fearless. He's not begotten. And he's free from fear and want. 
If you analyze he is one, he is not begotten, he is the creator, it is similar to our Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul hu Allah ahad, says Allah one and only. Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam lid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten, wa lam yakul lahu kufan, other nothing like him. And in Sikhism, Sikhism does not believe in avatar vada, meaning that God has got avatar. It's a monotheistic religion. God, in the unmanifest form, is called as Ekomkara and manifest form as Omkara. And there are various attributes of Almighty God given in the Guru Granth. Amongst them is, he's called as Kartar, that is the creator. Same in Arabic as Khalik. He's called as Parvardigar, the cherisher. Same as us, Rab. He's called as Lord, as Rab. He's also called as Kareem, the benevolent. He's called as Rahim, beneficent. He's also called as Vahe Guru, one God. So if we analyze, there are many similarities between the concept of God in Sikhism. Therefore, Sikhism doesn't believe in idol worship, doesn't believe in Avatar Vada. It's a monotheistic religion. And if we analyze, Guru Nanak was very much influenced even by Sant Kabir. And you find in the Granth many couplets also of Sant Kabir. One of them is, Dukme sumna sab kare, sukme kare na koye, jo sukme sumna kare to dukka hai hoye. Which means, in times of trouble, everyone remembers God. In times of happiness, no one remembers God. If you remember God in times of happiness, why should trouble touch you? Same as Allah says in Surah Al-Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 33, that when trouble touches man, he cries out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But once when the trouble goes away, he associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you realize that Sikhism is also a religion of one God, it's a monotheistic religion, does not be an idol worship. Those scholars say it's an amalgamation of Hinduism and Islam. And we realize that in the concept of God, it is quite similar to Islam. And for more details, you can refer to my video because the concept of God in major world religions. Let us spoken in more details on that. Hope that answers the question. Inshallah, we'll just have the last two questions uh, due to lack of time and we cannot continue. Maybe I have the next question from the brother over here. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fahad. I work as a computer programmer. Uh, my question is related to Islamic banking. Uh, what is meant when a certain Islamic bank says that they're going to offer a loan at an X percent APR? Is that not interest? No, that's a question that he wants to know about Islamic banking. Islamic banks offer a loan and they add a X percent. They call it service charge, whatever. Is it not interest? See, basically, interest is haram in Islam. The no is in eight different places where Allah says interest is haram. Allah clearly says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 278 to 79, that if you give up not your demands for interest, take notice of a war from Allah and his soul. So interest is haram. Now, as far as Islamic banking is concerned, as you mentioned, many Islamic banks which give loan, point to be noted that most of the Islamic banks that are there, I don't know of any Islamic bank which is 100% Islamic. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. In fact, one of my interests is Islamic banking. But there are many which are, mashallah, quite a lot Islamic. There are many which are frauds also, fine. Only namesake Islamic. What we have to note, that we as laymen, if we can check up, check up. If you analyze, there is Islamic system of musharika, profit and loss sharing, which is the best, safest. Musharika means you become a partner in it. Now, other aspects are the mudaribah is there. That is cost plus. In cost plus, many a time, people falter, and many a time there's nothing but catching the nose in long cut, you know. You say that it is nothing but trying to make a gimmick. So we have to analyze, and many fatwas are given on this is allowed, that is allowed, which many which I don't agree with also. So when an Islamic bank comes, we have to scrutinize who is on the Sharia board. Just by name, please don't go. That's not important. What they do, etc. So many of the Islamic banks, I wouldn't call them Islamic, they may be very small percentage Islamic. Now, in the Islamic bank, most of them do mudariba. In mudariba, there's a problem, cost plus, which comes. Sometimes it's possible, ijara is there, that is higher purchase is there, which is Islamic, musharika, is safe. Safe means if they're following Islamic principles, no? In other parts, we have to check up. And what we analyze that most of the banks, they falter, and because they compete with the normal conventional bank, they keep the same interest, so name is different. Naam ka farak label is different but the same. So we have to be careful while taking loan. But as a layman, if suppose you think it is Islamic and you take it, 
and if they are doing something wrong, out of ignorance we have gone. So the blame will come on them, not on you. If you know they are haram and then you go, then the blame will come on you. So it is the owners of the people running Islamic banks to check up whether they're following. What happened? There are many fatwas in this. And fatwa shopping is very easy. You know, what fatwa you want, you'll get. So they go and when Egypt will get, or Pakistan, or India. So they take fatwa, which is convenient for them, and then they sanction it. So you have to be careful while Islamic banking is there. Not that it's not possible. Possible, very difficult. There are some banks I know which are, mashallah, good, yet not 100%. And they know it's 100%, because unless you don't have the central system of Islamic, you can't be 100%. So the thing that, that there are many Islamic banks coming up, we have to check up whether Islamic or if it's there, but there is a system which you can do. So we have to check up the functioning, how they do, and then you have to decide whether they're right or wrong. Hope that answers the question. Exactly. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll just have the last question from the sister. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Uh, my question, and there's a small comment after it, should British Muslims develop a body for speaking to the media on Muslim issues? And I ask this question because currently in this environment, the media are talking about basic beliefs in our deen. And they're calling upon different people who don't represent any of our views about why we are Muslims. They're talking because we're um, going to the mosques and we're teaching our children, they think this is an extremist. And when they ask their brothers, uh, Muslim brothers and sisters, to attend on TV, these Muslim and brothers say that we are moderate Muslims. I am not a moderate Muslim. I am neither an extremist. I am a Muslim. And I would like that viewed over with one voice by the Muslim community, not a fragmented voice that's been conforming to the norms of this society. Mr. has a question that should the Muslims have a common body to represent the Muslims of British? Yes, they should have a common body for British Muslims, for American Muslims, for Indian Muslims, all the countries, as well as one international Muslim body also. One international, which we don't have. So we should have a voice of own. Better have one good united force, and I believe that you already have in Britain, known as MCB, Muslim Council of Britain, and I think you'll do a good job. Not in the media. Sorry, I'm, the Mus I am, I'm aware of the Muslim Council of Britain, but as you know, media is manipulation. They don't talk at the Muslim Council of Britain. They individually talk at different Muslims to re represent Muslims. The sister said that the Muslim Council of Britain is there, but the media doesn't talk. So you create your own media. That's what I'm saying. Media will run after you. You know, for me, in Bombay, the BBC asked me to give comments. The CNN, I don't give for my own reasons. The BBC, the CNN, the NDTV, See, when someone throws stones at you, raise yourself so high the stone should not reach you. They want what Dr. Zakinag has to comment, but I stay away from it for my own reasons. But you should come on the media. I stay away because already, alhamdulillah, my programs are coming in so many satellite channels, mashallah. Every day, one hour, two hours, twice a day, thrice a day. Now I'm afraid that when these people take my interview of five minutes, they may make it short and may change my view. That's the reason I stay away. And what I want to say, we have got so many channels showing a program, mashallah, no problem. So what we realize is that we should have our own media. Not only a body to represent media, we should have our own media. Own media. And that media should be powerful. <laughs> so that's the reason, mashallah, we have launched a satellite channel. If you see this, Peace TV. About seven months back, in the month of January 2006, on the 24th of January, we launched our own satellite channel by the name of Peace TV. Peace TV at present, mashallah, it is reaching more than 125 countries in the world. It is covering all the countries in Asia, in Middle East, as well as Africa, and parts of Australia. The beam is seen in Europe, but it's very weak. We require a big dish. Inshallah, we have plans to come on B-Sky B also. Inshallah, within the next few months, inshallah, we'll come on B-Sky B. It will be a free to air channel. It's the it's the first of its kind in the way it's an English channel, it's an international channel. It's not a localized channel talking only about one country. We have speakers, mashallah, from America, from Canada, from UK, from Malaysia, from Saudi, from India, from Pakistan, mashallah. It's not a local channel, it's an international channel talking about comparative religion. We have programs of children, we have programs for family, mashallah, interviews, debates, TV talks. And here it is that the channel should be on Quran and Sunnah. When I started the channel, the first thing I said, I prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was a dream, 
And finally, we launched it, mashallah. And I said that, please don't let me do anything haram. If I'm forced to do something haram, I better shut down the channel than run it in a haram way. Many people start a channel, they are good, but then they compromise. No compromise. First, there's no lady, then lady comes with naqab, then without naqab, then without hijab, then low neck and everything. So we want channels which are, why should we? See, we should not run after money. No, ads will not come. We care a hang for ads. See, you should not run after money. Money should run after you. You give quality. You should have faith in Allah. Do you want Allah's help or do you want the money and the pound and the dollars? What do you want? Say, Allah is sufficient. Problem is we have more faith in other things than in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our channel, mashallah, to the core, no music. We have sound effects, mashallah, hala sound effects. We have duff, we have natural sound effects. And if you see it, it has a great impact, mashallah. We have graphics, but halal. We have own committee. And we produce high quality. You see these cameras? We have got six cameras from Bombay. Normally in Bombay, when you shoot for nine cameras, we have 50 staff. Here we have got only 12 staff. 10, actually, of the camera crew. Your limitation. We have the best of people, mashallah, best of equipment, alhamdulillah. Now this is the digital beta cam. We have got high definition. High definition hasn't started yet. There's no channel in the world which is shooting on high definition now. So we don't compete with Muslim channels. We compete with international non-Muslim channels. And the best so far in religious channels is the God TV. They are on 15 satellites. They are reaching more than 225 countries, 275 million people. And we are programming in such a way that it is a spiritual edutainment channel. Inshallah, the next plan is to have a separate channel in different language, English and Urdu, then have even news channel, Inshallah. But it will be international news, not local news. Not only of Bombay, not only of London, international news. So that we can voice. How many international media do we have? Do you have any international newspaper phone? Do you have an international news magazine, like the Time magazine, Newsweek? Where do we have? We have some magazines taken out by Muslims, which only Muslims read, either in Urdu or in Arabic or in English only read by Muslims. What we want that non-Muslims should watch it. So we can at least say that, alhamdulillah, our channel, mashallah, even the program that we have, that 25% at least, mashallah, of the programs that I give, whether in India or other parts, mashallah, here I feel more non-Muslims should come. Why? I don't know so many. Who's to blame? That the publicity should be towards, towards the non-Muslim, mashallah. So even the channel that we have, sister, we should have our own media, own newspapers, own magazines, own satellite channels, which convey the true picture of Islam so that we can present our view to the world and the haq of Islam. Hope that answers the question. I invite Brother Yusuf Chambers to give the vote of thanks. Jazakallah khair for Dr. Zakir and I coming tonight and all of you coming tonight, contributing tonight. Remember that educating the educators, it doesn't stop after tonight's event. Dr. Zakir Knight will be in Croydon with us, but he never finishes answering the questions. He's always got the answers. Masha Allah, alhamdulillah. And I think you should make the biggest takbir and we'll all go home. Takbir! Takbir! And the third one? Takbir! <laughs> there is none greater.